So today I'm going to do a video on the bridged T-coil. And uh, the bridged T-coil is an interesting circuit because in RF design, um, the name of the game is basically trying to increase the bandwidth without affecting anything else. Um, and the bridge T-coil is a trade-off between, um, it's, it's a fairly simple circuit as far as it has a minimal number of elements. Um, but it provides a rather large increase in bandwidth. And so what is the bridge T-coil circuit? Well, it's just your standard common source amplifier with two coupled inductors, which are bridged by a capacitor. So this is the whole circuit. And the output is taken from the center of the bridge. And typically, you've, you've got some load capacitance that you'll want to consider here. So this is the bridge uh, the bridge T-coil circuit. We say that the bridging capacitor has a value CB, the drain resistor has a value RD, and these two coils uh, will say that they have values each equal to L. And uh, they are coupled inductors, and they've got a certain coupling factor K. And K just represents uh, how much magnetic flux is shared uh, between the two coils. OK, so uh, the analysis of this circuit is not at all straightforward. Um, as you can imagine, it's uh, rather complicated. But the typical way of doing things is to transform the circuit uh, to get rid of the coupled inductances. And basically, you're left with the same original circuit so you've got your drain resistor, and you've got two now no longer coupled inductors, and another output inductor. So I'm going to call these two inductors both L1, and I'm going to call this inductor L2. And then it's connected, as before, to our common source amplifier, and the bridging capacitor is still the same. So, so to analyze this circuit, you could use node analysis, mesh analysis. Uh, most commonly, uh, people use a delta Y transform on these three elements here. Uh, or there, other people have used the extra element theorem. But the whole goal is to figure out what is the transfer function V out over Vn. That's, that's just the name of the game. Well. If we were to use node analysis, uh, which I'm not going to do because that would take a very long time, uh, we would get a transfer function that looks like this. Um, and the only reason I'm writing this down is for completeness, because this is really um, a very ugly transfer function. It doesn't give a lot of intuition. It's just, um, I'm just writing it for completeness. So as promised, uh, there is the transfer function. It's really quite ugly. Uh, but the important things to take away from it are that on top, we've got a polynomial of degree 2. So we've got an s squared, an s, and a constant. And on the bottom, we've got a polynomial of degree 4. So there's an s to the 4 term, an s cubed term, an s squared term, an s term, and a constant 1. Now, if uh, we were to clean up this uh, a little bit, um, we might say that, well, we've got obviously two zeros on the top portion on, in the numerator, and we've got four poles in the denominator. So if we were to say that those two zeros canceled out the two poles, then we'd only have a second order transfer function to deal with on the bottom. And indeed, it, this is by far the most easy way of analyzing this circuit and finding out what its unique properties are, assuming that the two zeros cancel the poles. Now, if you do uh, either polynomial long division or uh, follow the method provided in the paper that I'll link in the description, you find that the conditions for the poles being canceled is that the inductance value uh, of the original inductors, so the inductors on uh, these inductors, 
this value of L here. Um, the value for the, that inductance in terms of the magnetic coupling factor and other components is RD squared times CL divided by 2 times 1 minus K. And this is not, uh, I don't expect you to understand where this came from, but it's basically the result of doing polynomial long division. And we also see that the bridging capacitor CB must equal CL over 4 times 1 plus K over 1 minus K. And these two conditions uh, are our requirements in order for pole zero cancellation to happen. So they give us relationships between the inductance and the capacitance values of the circuit and the magnetic coupling factor. Now this is where things start to get interesting and where we should start to be kind of careful about what we're doing. So I'm gonna redraw, rewrite these equations in terms of the quantities that we have control over and the quantities that we don't. So initially, uh, we've got, I'm, I'm going to write the quantities we have control over in green and the quantities we don't in white. So we're going to require some uh, DC gain, and that's going to fix our RD value. We also likely don't have a lot of control over CL, because that's typically uh, determined by the next stage of our amplifier. And we don't have control over the number two or the number one, uh, but we do have control over K, the magnetic coupling factor. And likewise, uh, for CB, uh, we do have control over that because we get to determine what it is. Uh, we don't have control over CL, but we do have control over the magnetic coupling factor. So by writing the equations in this way, we can see that there's three things that we get to control. There's CB, there's K and there's L. However, we're enforcing two conditions on the circuit. So we're saying that L must equal this and CB must equal this. So we're giving up two of our degrees of freedom. Uh, effectively, we are only, um, we're only left with K. So we can rewrite these now, uh, these equations, if we choose to let L and CB be the values that we're going to fix now. Uh, because we're losing it two degrees of freedom. We say that L is RD squared CL over two times one minus K, and CB is equal to CL over four times one plus K over one minus K. Now, written in this form, it's immediately obvious that we don't actually control the value of L and CB. The only thing that we get to manipulate here is K. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. And it gets more interesting when we rewrite uh, the circuit, the, uh, the transfer function. So remember, we said that the two poles are canceled by the two zeros. So we had a fourth degree polynomial on the bottom in terms of S to the fourth. Uh, but now we only have a second degree polynomial. So that's just one plus at uh, two zeta over omega naught s plus s squared over omega naught squared. That's the standard form of a second order uh, transfer function. So we can write any transfer function, no matter what it is in this form. And if we write it in this form, then we see that omega naught has a value of one over rd times the square root of CL times CB, and zeta has a value of one-fourth CL over CB. But remember that we don't actually control um, any of these values anymore because we've said that L and CB are going to be fixed by K. So we can rewrite omega naught and zeta in terms of the things that we do control and if that's the case, then we see that omega naught is equal to 2 over RDCL times the square root of 1 plus K over 1 minus K. And zeta is equal to 1 half 
times the square root of one minus k over one plus k. And I'm just gonna redraw these k's uh, in green so that we remember what it is we actually control in this situation. So one minus k, one plus k, one minus k, one plus k. And uh, so this is interesting because it says that we only have one degree of control over our circuit. So we only get to choose k. Uh, and once we choose k, we know what our value of L has to be, we know what C has to be, we know what omega naught is, and we know what zeta is. So we only get to make one decision. And that actually uh, turns out to be a good thing because it makes our lives much easier. So if we want to design the circuit for a specific zeta, so say maximum flatness, which corresponds in the frequency uh, response, which corresponds to zeta equals one over square root of two, then we know that our we know what our k has to be, and we know what all other values of the circuit must be. Similarly, if we want to design a critically damped system, zeta equals one, then we know what k we need for that, and we know what all of our other circuit components have to be. So we only have to make one choice in designing our circuit, and this makes things very easy. So in the next video, I'm going to show you why it is, uh, what makes the T-coil so special. And uh, I'm going to do a couple examples uh, that, will, that will demonstrate that.